introduce yourself. Guys, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves and, and let's get on. Thanks. Um, thank you, Marty. Um, um, uh, I particularly appreciate this forum. Marty, I think, does a, a super effective job of getting diverse people into the discussions. Um, so, um, you know, I hadn't planned to talk about Texas, but Texas is between the second or third largest economy in the US. If you look at by state, depends upon the category. Um, it is the largest graduator of engineers. Um, when Austin Ventures left, um, Austin went from having a fairly middling share of um, seed venture investment. If you look at um, venture assets deployed um, in the US to actually a disproportionate per capita um, in investment level now ranking fourth or fifth, even though it is a one and a half percent of, you know, you know just Austin by itself is one and a half percent of the economy. It typically ranks by city as number four, number, number five, number six in terms of seed and startup venture investing. So yes, the very early part of venture is alive and well in Austin. From B round onward, it is well down the list. There's not a lot of later stage capital here. Um, um, my background, um, I'm formally trained in math, economics, finance, linguistics, um, and then what I would call information theory, which at the, at the time I went through school was really applied mathematics, but you see it as design of experiments and computer science in current literature. I went through the University of Chicago uh, Northwestern for an MBA. I was at the University of Wisconsin and I'm a, a, a rare Videshi non-Indian who actually attended an IIT in India, actually in linguistics and North Indic languages um, as a diversification from my math background. Um, I've spent time at Dell um, in business development uh, in the early 90s. I'm one of the 20,000 or so folks that exited Dell with with more than um, you know a million dollars of something out of the experience of their growth. Um, uh, I spent five years at Booz Allen post MBA running around the world restructuring large companies. Can you, can you put those the lights up in the baby's room? Uh, whoever's talking about the baby's room, please mute yourself. <laughs> um, um, I have 40 years of what I would say is work in the innovation world. So I've touched 800 inventions, um, about 10,000 products, and I've worked with about 450 companies around the development of a value proposition and then the commercialization of it. Um, that includes 36 startups, which is the last 15 years or so of my career has been focused on how do you get capital um, financial capital, intellectual capital, and human capital together to commercialize innovation. Um, the last um, six or eight years, it's been around the funding of startups and the, and the development of later stage startups into, act, into really the acquisitions. I haven't, done on, I haven't paid much attention to IPOs. Acquisition is about seven times more likely now than an, than an IPO although I think specs are gonna change that a bit. Um, so we're gonna now, um, I, hope, I hope the other panelists are there. Marty, I hope you assure me. Uh, um, Michael Boyle, are you around? I'm here, David. Okay, um, will you jump in um, a brief introduction of yourself and maybe um, a little bit about um, the uniqueness of your fund work and actually, a little bit about yourself and how you ended up where you're at. And then we're gonna build a sort of generic model of what's good about VC as an asset class. Cause I don't know that the last panel actually talked about what's good about FinTech as an asset class. I wanna start formally there. Um, and then we'll come back to, well, I'm, I'll make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk about what's unique about your positioning in the, in the VC world specifically, cause I love your model. I think you and I could talk for two hours. Um, well, thanks so much, David. I appreciate it. Um, and hello to everybody, um, and, including and my friends on the big, panel. You're taking a big picture, I see. Big picture. Well, removal. I am with Ecliptic Capital. Um, okay. And so I, what better background than an eclipse? But anyway, um, so my background, um, I wrote my first line of code in 1971. David and I have some similarities there. Um, my dad was an economist. Um, fast forward, I, went, I started at a startup. Um, in the early 80s in the fintech space. 
uh, became one of the dominant uh, banking software uh, providers in the country. Um, from there, I went on to Wall Street and I spent 30 years in investment banking, um, running technology for Merrill Lynch in New York and London. And then uh, I was CIO and COO at Robertson Stevens, the investment bank. After that, I uh, did a stint at Allstate as CIO and COO, and then Aflac as CIO. And then I left there to become the CEO of a startup firm uh, that was in the fintech space. And then three years ago, I joined Ecliptic Capital um, here in Austin, Texas. We're a $100 million permanent capital structure and evergreen fund. Uh, we deploy about 20 to $30 million annually into pre-seed, seed, series A rounds. Um, most of our Investments are done in Texas because we think this is an amazing place to invest in right now. As um, David was saying, we are the ninth largest country in the world. We like to think of ourselves as a country um, in many ways, but um, we have a number of different things about our fund um, that um, we think are very different than the traditional models. And I can stop there or we can go deeper right now, David. What do you want me to do? Um, let's talk a little bit. So I have this tick mark about, you know, why, if I'm an allocator to family, we're talking to family offices, why would you put an allocation of your capital into venture capital specifically? And you know, the, you know, the list that I'll tick off is it's generally pretty high yield when you compare it to other asset classes, it's uncorrelated with public markets, it's long tenure, so you can get that return for seven to 10 years, depends you know, what the specific fund is. It captures black swan effect like, you're unlikely to be surprised by something new arriving in an economy if you're specifically investing in something new arriving in the economy, um, et cetera. I mean, you know, is there, is there something else I'm missing there? Well, you know? I'll just add one thing. I was talking to uh, the head of Utimco, um, Brett Hurt, um, not, I mean, um, Brett, Brett Harris, not too long ago. And one of the things that he said to me was, and Utimco is, of course, the, one of the largest um, institutional investors in Texas. And the one thing he said to me was their investments in early stage venture were by far their highest yielding asset class. And I think that there's something to be said for that, um, particularly when you take our model, because our entire team are former vent um, you know, operators, entrepreneurs who've been building, scaling, selling and investing in companies for 30 plus years. Um, and as a result of that, we have a very hands-on operational focus to what we do. Um, we, you know, we do time curation on our front end, which we think is highly important. We look at companies for six to 12 months and talk with them before getting um, into bed with them um, and getting married. Um, and after we actually start, um, after we have an investment in place, we move to a weekly cadence with them where we focus on their operational scaling issues. And, um, you know, our, our team have worked for companies as diverse as Genentech, Merrill Lynch, Apple, Goldman Sachs, Dell, right, AT&T, so, you know. So let me jump in that because you've blended. So yes, there's a lot of lovely things about the uniqueness of your model. And we're going to come back more to that. But what you pointed out as a characteristic of the asset class of venture is that we're trading on private information. Um, and you've just highlighted what I describe as the 25 hours of due diligence you need to really understand a private asset, the way I, I, I calculate that. Um, but this is private access, private information, private capital flowing. So there's an opportunity if you spend the time to learn about the investment to find alpha, you know, very specifically, if you, if you trust the surrogate of the fund that does that for you. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. and the thing yeah. I'll, I'll add to that, because I think you called out a good thing there, David, is yeah. um, most private equity investments have little transparency. Um, and our model is very much focused on providing full transparency to our investors. Um, and we have a, um, a deal flow portal where we um, are going to be opening up to scoring, um, not just to our investors, but to people across the world who want to be interested in things that are driven by things like hard science and whatnot. And so we're looking to provide a level of transparency that's really unparalleled. Um, I mean, I've invested in a number of venture funds over the years and I get my quarterly letters. Um, in our portal to our LPs, we actually provide real-time information on the status of those companies, the metrics okay. that they have that they're trying to hit. Um, asks to our LPs, can right, somebody, so, you know. Yes, so what I get there is that's private data and then you're leveraging, you're leveraging that private data. So that's follow on in additional investment. So uh, lo lovely. So that's in your particular model, there is that exploitation of private data. So I'm gonna jump because I wanna be curious. There's a bunch of us here and we'll come back. Um, Chris, are you around? Are you, are you live? 
I am here, David. How are you? Lovely, lovely. So let's segue over to Chris. Introduce yourself a little bit and, and notice my pace because there's, there's a bunch of us. Uh, I'll, make, I'll make this one quick and short. So I'm, I'm Chris Piedmont. I'm from Neoterra Capital. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur uh, since I was 10 years old. I actually started off selling uh, home products door to door as a kid. And uh, right out of college, went on to uh, join a group of, uh, at a startup that uh, automated the front counter of the U.S. Postal Service for the first time. Uh, been in entrepreneurial work and startups ever since, 35 years. Uh, about uh, 20 years or so ago, I started doing investments in other startups. Uh, I liked working with the teams. So uh, NeoTerra's model kind of evolved out of that. It's a combination of both uh, strategic investment and uh, you know, advisory services. So in, in some respects, it's, it's like Michael's firm over at Ecliptic. We like to stay close to our, our portfolio companies. We don't just you know, show up at, at the board meetings. I think that uh, type of guidance, particularly at the very early stage, and we work very early, uh, sometimes just one or two guys with an idea uh, is, is necessary, particularly when people are doing things for the first time. Um, you know, that's, as a- uh, That's a theme I'm gonna, I, I describe as mammalian rather than reptilian. So you're operators that get involved in supporting the investments that you go in. So there's an, there's an added value of the, the deal book and the, um, the um, playbook and the experience of the fund itself, not just the innovation or the idea that comes from the investment. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, we see a much, much better success rate when we can help, you know, mentor and coach our, our entrepreneurs in their ventures. Um, you know, many of us at NeoTerra have been through many, many startups. We've made all the mistakes. We know what they are. And the ability to come in and help, you know, nurture these firms definitely plays a role in their success. Okay. There's, so I'm, um, you know, one of, the, one of the cool things I'm just going to mention um, talking to um, Chris is he's part of a, um, a, a team that builds a, you know, world record setting um, biplane, racing biplane. So um, when, when he describes involved in operations and technology, it's a, it's a bit of an understatement. It's, I would say deeply involved in some very sophisticated engineering. Um, um, are, are you also, I, I, what I understand a little bit of your thesis uniqueness is that you're not afraid of technology. So you're not specifically looking for how can I scale a SaaS company and, uh, you know, achieve growth, but there are other opportunities and other pieces of alpha. Uh, that's that's right. right, absolutely right. I mean, we look at you know new technologies all the time, uh, very much like once again, like Michael's firm and, and some of the work they probably have done in quantum. You know, we look at new material sciences. Um, we look at uh, technological advancements that are coming out of things in the semiconductor space, uh, even uh, others that are, are driven uh, you know by needs in the uh, advancement in the cultural and political landscapes we're working at now to solve some of the problems that have evolved because of that. So we are definitely very, very technology focused, but we are somewhat industry agnostic. Uh, you know, we do tend to look at a variety of industries and disruptive, uh, you know, investments, uh, you know, things that definitely if, if matured should exit at multi-billion dollar exits, not, not small plays. Okay. So you have a theme there of, of, of diversification or, you know, a lot of assets, a few assets? No, no it, it's, it's definitely a diversified portfolio, but we do look at the areas that we expect, you know, significant value and growth over the next decade. That's the material sciences, uh, advancements in semiconductors as we go from okay. the, um, you know, monolithic uh, single chip designs to two, two and a half and 3D integration. Uh, advances in cybersecurity are absolutely necessary, and we have some that we're working on there as well. And uh, other industries, including uh, construction and uh, fashion, quite frankly, it's a wide variety, but uh, it all comes from the basis of a disruptive technology or a new and emerging market. Okay. Anything to add um, for the asset class of VC that we hadn't mentioned? Um, yeah, no, I, like I said, I, you know, Michael covered quite well. The important thing is that you invest in opportunities that have you know, a large uh, possibility for high returns. Uh, okay, all right. So that's lovely. So there, yep. Let me jump in there. So that's the asymmetry of the investment. So um, mm -hmm. there can be extraordinary winners um, is the way to, to, to talk about that. So even if you have a relatively few number of assets, if one of them is extraordinary, it floats the entire fund. Um, um, so I'll pick that. <laughs> um, 
and let me let me jump on. I'll be a, I'll, I'll be a little bit, and, but we'll come back. I promise. And please, everybody, leave their microphones on. So if this is going to be an accumulating conversation, I hope if I do this right. Um, Hunter, can, are you are you available? Um, I'm here. Hey, David. Hey, jump in. Great. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give my background from the perspective of family offices. I think in, in my opinion, the hardest part for family offices when they're looking at venture is to get with the right venture funds. The best funds are usually very access restricted, hard to get into. Sometimes their allocation size requests pose problems. Next play is largely built to solve that problem. We are a venture fund of funds but one that has specifically focused on building a unique value add LP community. And for us, that is grounded in the world of sports. We have eight team owners of professional sports teams as LPs, many professional athletes across football, basketball, baseball, you name it, including probably about a, a third of the starting quarterbacks in the NFL. And those are people that along with a lot of the family offices and endowments we work with that can be very influential to a lot of the funds and companies that we invest in. So our differentiating advantage to a family office or really to anyone choosing to invest with Nextplay is that we can get you into funds that you can't get into on your own. And as a byproduct of that, we can then get you into deals that are not shopped, that are not available. I'll pause there. My, my background, uh, I went to Vanderbilt here in Nashville, which is thinks of itself as kind of a small Austin. So we're going to keep nipping at you guys' heels down there and hope that we can build the same kind of ecosystem that, uh, that Austin is probably a decade ahead of us on. I spent most of my 20s playing football in the NFL. I played eight years for the Bears in Chicago. And I went to business school at Northwestern while I was playing finished both of those things around the same time and I've been in the venture world ever since. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I did not know, I did not know that. Um, thank you very much. So um, to clarify that, that goes back to this uniqueness of the asset class, having private access in private, um, private deal making. Um, and by virtue of who, who is invested and who is part of your fund, you are able to make investments in your fund to fund status that others cannot get into. Um, and that's a very interesting and unique thesis for me. Um, thank you. Um, Kyle, are you on? I am, yes. Um, will you, can you, um, can you share a little bit? Hi, share right. a little bit about yourself. You, you follow the sequence that we've just done. Um, no problem. You... Yeah, so uh, my name is Kyle Riesting. Uh, I've been a technology uh, investor my entire career. I started off in the world uh, through a firm called Jeff Moore Capital. Uh, it was a European-based uh, uh, venture capital firm focused uh, across a broad, broad spectrum of technology from B2B SaaS software to semis, telco and infrastructure, and uh, fintech and payments. Uh, I actually then kind of transitioned into the private equity buyout world uh, where I transitioned to work with List Equity Partners uh, at its early stages uh, of its growth, which is now coming on to be a So just data. slow that down just a little bit. Talk yeah. just a little bit about Vista. Also, it's again, but here in Texas, yes. Yeah. Um, um, and I don't, for those who are familiar or not familiar, talk about the scale of Vista because it, for me, is a very interesting place. Um, yes. So Vista has now since gone on since I was there in 2013, uh, managing about $70 billion of uh, assets. Uh, you know, it employs, I think, across its portfolio it's technically i think i believe now is the third largest combined software company in the world uh, if you were to aggregate all of the uh, employees across its entire portfolio so when you think about the innovation uh and the, the the amount of industries and jobs created through the entire portfolio it's 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 extremely massive in its scale and i think and, one of the things like that and and the this you know the vista playbook talk a little bit about that um yeah so the Vista, I mean, so the, the Vista playbook is this basically just a set of operating initiatives uh, that is uh, unique to the firm uh, that is employed across each portfolio company uh, to drive value creation, uh, focusing across a broad, uh, broad initiatives of, from sales and marketing to product development, uh, to sales comp, to operations, uh, utilization rates across implementation and services and support uh, to talent. 
uh, which is a big piece uh, around, there's a standardized kind of test that is given to kind of each employee uh, at the time of acquisition uh, from the senior executive level all the way down to entry level jobs uh, is something that is very unique to how uh, the firm assesses talent, which in technology, in my opinion, is uh, it's not a hard asset class. Uh, you're, 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 you're really focused on the people. Uh, that is what drives innovation and that is what drives the organization's board. So apply enough capital, know how to apply it, have resources and playbooks to do it, and, and you get efficient growth out of it. Uh, and for me, Vista is the epitome of that. So I, thank you for pausing on that. Now continue on. I know you are not just at Vista. I, I, for me, that is the, um, the epitome of the large private equity play of the, the, of the first two theses we heard from, uh, from Mike um, and, and Chris is like, Get in, get in, and, and help the investment when you when you have enough capital in your to scale. Uh, you know that's there. And again, another Texas model. Um, all right, keep yep. keep going on you. No uh, problem. Uh, I then uh, was a founding member of a firm here in Austin called Stratum Capital, about four hundred fifty million dollars of uh, AUM. Uh, I've done thirty transactions over the last seven years uh, on the buyout front. So best way to think about Stratum was a is a smaller version of Vista. Um, I actually recently this fall uh, left Stratum to found Vegvisir Capital, uh, which is my firm. Uh, it's in its infancies uh, of uh, its, uh, its, you know, its life cycle, but really where we're focused is combining kind of my experience level across uh, various asset classes within technology, uh, focused at, uh, on investing in uh, enterprise technology ventures across the intersection of software, data, and payments. Uh, so really finding core SaaS uh, suites uh, where there's an ability to kind of monetize existing data sets or existing transactional volume through ancillary revenue streams outside of your core uh, suites uh, to, in a sense, accelerate growth, uh, which is something that I see more and more these days of, you know, moving from business models that are just core, you know, work workflow uh, and automation to core workflow and automation with data and intelligence to payments. So that's so is, that, uh, is that a relatively narrow number of assets? You know, so I hear a very specific thesis that sounds like you have deep, deep expertise and knowledge. And so the, if you're in an area, we know how to grow you and we know what you are and where there's value, very specific target. Um, so does that mean you're targeting 30 assets or you're looking for a full portfolio of 150? Give, give, yeah. give me a sense of that. Yeah, yeah so gonna, it's de definitely much more targeted. So. Uh, as far as the business model focus, it's exactly what you said. I've got a you know, system and playbook around how to monetize those, those uh, existing legacy data sets or transactional volumes and building out product suites uh, to complement your core SaaS subscription workflows, uh, as well as then being stage agnostic. So not necessarily doing seed and early to series A, which I've done over my course of my career and personally, uh, to obviously then leveraging the experience I've had in the private equity buyout uh, asset class and using that as a means to create an interesting portfolio of kind of risk, uh, you know, risk appetite of, of having some poor cash flowing majority transactions with earlier stage C, you know, kind of C, C series A uh, types so, of investments. So again, I hear a very private equity like model, um, a lot, lots of search and very careful filter. When you know you've got something you can work on, you know how to add a lot of value to it. It's very specific. Correct. So, all right. So again, that's, that's exploitation of private expertise in private information in very particular situations. Um, thank you. Um, and, and now we're gonna jump. Um, so Alex, are you on? Alex. Um, I'm here. Um, so Alex is actually speaking from inside of a venture who ended, you know, was invited to our panel. Um, if you could just describe your venture a little bit um, and then you know, for me, specifically describe the experience of what it's like to take a, you know, a very specific technology that's not high growth SaaS, you know, and argue scalability or find the kind of venture investment, what you'd need in order to succeed. Go ahead, Alex. Certainly. Thank you. Um, so Your video I'm, on? Yes, I'm right here. I'm in the purple suit. You should be able to see me very okay. easily. All right. <laughs> Anyways, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Cool, so um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is Alex Blum, I'm the Chief Impact Officer of Applied Bioplastics. Um, just here as an example of an investment, obviously one of these things is not like the other on this panel here. 
um, you know, we're not SaaS, we're not software or like really easy scale or a physical product replacement with, um, you know, better and similar properties. Uh, what we make is a, uh, a low carbon thermoplastic replacement, it's a drop in replacement for uh, most durable goods manufacturing. Um, I'm here to kind of argue that, that you know, impact is, is uh, undervalued, underpriced future value. Um, I think there's just unrealized alpha uh, in, in impact in general, um, you know, referencing the previous panel talking about Everybody says they do ESG. One of the things about having quantifiable uh, impact in your business is that you can you can not only prove that there's there's uh, uh, something nice and fuzzy that that makes your investors feel good, but something that's also going to make them money. Um, obviously, compared to the rest of the panel here, just as my background, nowhere near as impressive. I uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree in liberal arts from the local uh, university here, UT Austin. Um, you know, just smart enough to be dangerous, uh, you know, i.e. knowing that I don't personally have the expertise to lead an advanced materials company. Um, the, the one thing that I do have is, is knowing that the requirement to be an investor organization is to build a team of people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, so all that said, um, you know, we, we uh, manufacture this uh, thermoplastic at price parity with petrochemical feedstocks, proving that, you know, impact doesn't just have to be uh, feel good. We, we can actually make some money and be profitable and uh, compete with the big boys. As far as, um, you know, all of that being, uh, you know, an Austin company, it's actually been quite challenging earlier on uh, to, to find investors who are not just interested in high growth SaaS, uh, who, are, who are more interested in patient capital and impact. Uh, that's not typically something that, that you'd see. So my partners and I were walking around Austin, uh, you know, before the pandemic saying, hey, are you, are you interested in this? Would you, would you like to see more about this? And absolutely nobody, like, you know, doors shutting in our face over and over and over. Um, it, it took so me a so that's, a, that's a characteristic of being in the manufacturing space as a, as a feedstock into manufacturing. That's think, also a physical product. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's a, a bit of all of the above. Also, you know, my, my uh, CEO, my co-founder and I, uh, you know, we had no expertise going into this two years ago. So, so people would look at us and say, how is it that you can build a company when you don't personally have a background in the science that you're, you're working on? And, and, you know, they were right. It was challenging, but uh, you know, now we have a team of 16. And as I said, gathering the, the investable people to yeah. us. All right. Creating it. So, so what part of what I hear there is in that story, you went early out before maybe you were ready to, to look like an investment. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, people so, like Chris so, are out there who, uh, you know, pre-team, you've got two guys with an idea and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I wish we'd met then, Chris. But, uh, so, so, so let's, 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 let's jump too. around. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on to the rest of the panel. Um, th thank you very much, Alex. Um, um, and, you know, um, you know, do do speak up in our conversation as we go forward. So I lo I'm looking at Marty's lovely survey. Again, thank you, Marty, for running the tightest digital ship I, I get to participate in. Um, and the 72% positive response question was, you know, are there gaps? What are the biggest gaps in venture stage, venture investment, geography segment exact, you know, give me a thesis around venture where, where there is, you know, unexploited alpha is the way I read it. And I'll, mm -hmm. give, and I'll give my own thesis around it, which we've heard a piece of that in our discussion. Um, I am a fan of leaning into risk. Uh, I, in other words, investing in as early stage as possible, because for me, although there is an increase in risk with an undeveloped company in an uncertain market, et cetera, um, I believe the pricing available for those assets far exceeds the risk, you know, the risk in place. So there's alpha, there's better risk adjusted return. So I like go early and go wide, make sure you have enough diversification, hundreds or, or uh, 250 or so more assets, the sort of model that you'd see from 500 startups or from right side capital, if you're familiar with that term out of the West Coast. Any, you know, anybody, let's start with Michael, get, get, jump in, opportunity. Sure. Absolutely, David. Yeah, Texas is a huge opportunity as is the middle of the country. Most, 80% um, of the GDP is actually between the coasts, not on them. Yeah. And um, just it's like a, Chris it's mentioned- a five to one in, It's a five to one imbalance. If you look per city or MSA at assets under management in venture versus GDP, middle of the country, five to one underinvested. Women, five to one underinvested. You know, there, there are certain categories like that. Yeah, I jump, yep. I jump in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, and I also, I'll, I'll echo something that Alex said and Chris said as well. We think applied materials is a huge thing. We have investments in early stage companies in graphene and also in fire suppression and thermal insulation. 
um, one of which came through Halliburton Labs out of Houston, um, where we're also um, helping them with some of the stuff that they're doing down there. And um, also, I'm going to echo something that Brad said earlier, um, which was in the Bitcoin and blockchain space, we have a very in interesting company here in Austin called Unchained Capital, which actually provides custody, um, advanced security solutions for custody. Um, and lending against Bitcoin. Um, and when you look at um, what's going on in that space right now with Coinbase and others um, snapping up a variety of different infrastructure plays on the FinTech side, we think that that's big as well. Yeah, so pieces that apply economies of scope for FinTech to existing FinTech players to gobble up, I think is a great play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? I'm gonna jump in opportunities in specifically to find alpha that's unexploited in the venture space. Alex? Chris, uh, I'll, just, I'll just chime in real quick. I, I would definitely agree with Michael uh, from a geography perspective. Uh, I'm very bullish and, and specifically kind of in the Midwest uh, where you have good engineering programs uh, where traditionally students would, would flee the to the coast. Uh, I think that that has actually come back uh, with COVID. Uh, you saw actually a fleeing up from New York and from San Francisco of realizing uh, the work from home model, which I actually uh, believe will, will be kind of more of a permanent shift uh, and, a redu and a reduction of footprint uh, out of those key geographies, uh, which opens up, I think, a robust opportunity across uh, a broad area of new geographies that traditionally were, were very small as far as the number of quality opportunities coming out of these, those geographies. Uh, very bullish on Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Nashville, uh, just from, from my perspective outside. Which, Wichita, of, Wichita. Uh, um, Kansas, Kansas City. Uh, yeah, Kansas City. Some, some very interesting things uh, coming out of, uh, out of that geography as well, uh, which I'm, I'm frankly very, very bullish on. Yeah. And quite frankly, I, I agree with what you know, Kyle and you guys are saying as well. There's there's some elements that you always want to have that, that have a tendency to, to help. One is is a good university. Uh, a lot of things come out of the schools. Uh, two is a, is a a sense of entrepreneurship. Uh, you'll find that you know, especially in the Midwest, there are a lot of small and medium businesses, a lot of mom and pop type of operations. So you don't have a lot of you know the big corporations are focused in New York, they're focused in uh, Miami and L.A. and Chicago. Uh, but when you get into other places, a lot of it is, is you know, small business. That entrepreneurial spirit coupled with the education really does help. Um, yeah, David, I'd, I'd jump in. I mean, as a fund of funds, we have a unique perspective. We have 26 or so funds across two vintages. Most of them are in California and New York. And I agree with everyone on the call but great funds in these areas where the companies are coming from are unfortunately a trailing indicator. It, it takes a, a mature ecosystem and some big wins locally before there is capital to create venture funds that are focused only on those areas. And, and there's some exceptions like Drive Capital in Columbus would be a great example. They moved there because they knew that that's where the customers of the next generation of startups was gonna be. But that's former Sequoia, former Thrive. Like that's a bunch of former, that's a bunch of people that spun out from venture funds that were on the coasts. And so the best way to access the companies that are being built in non-coastal cities, unfortunately, for at least another five years or so is probably still the same venture funds. So that's, that's a lovely segue. So yeah. there's another element going on here, which is it's not just what have you found, you know, sourced, what have you done the pricing and due diligence around and invested in, but there's also the successing. So this is, this is the ecosystem that follows on after your investments as a particular fund. So the argument around the two coasts being, or specifically New York and San Francisco, um, being the place where you want to find a fund is because there are follow on folks in the food chain to provide the additional capital you need for the companies that grow up out of your early stage investments, right? So you need the whole follow on capital ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. How do you integrate to make sure there's enough follow on capital and where does it come from? Hey guys, let me break in a second. Uh, I think uh, Rob Collarina has a question. Rob, are you out there, Rob? Hey Marty, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, a very interesting panel um, by you all uh, on, on the VC side. I had a, just a quick question for maybe one or two of the panelists. Um, you know, I think Hunter uh, 
interesting background on sports and sort of that niche. Can you speak a little bit about um, the importance of things like, you know, the playoff, the NCAA is going on and, and, and pro sports playoffs in, in this uh, sort of pandemic environment. And then sort of related, maybe one of the other panels, can you comment a little bit about exits you're seeing just given COVID tailwinds, how you're handling that, how are you maximizing value because in some cases you may have sort of have peak value in some of these um, um, COVID facing strategies. All right, um, so that's the specific exploitation of current circumstances around COVID. Change is happening like, is it time to invest in a cruise ship company or you know, sports that have changed, things that have had live populations for audiences, et cetera. Um, yep, thank yeah. you, Rob. You're welcome, uh, maybe Hunter. Yeah, I mean, the specific role that sports would play, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know the degree to which everybody who was on was here for the prior panel, but I, I would look at it in the same way of way someone on that panel was describing what's happened in the last nine to 12 months around blockchain. I think the innovations that you've seen in the way the ticketing industry or the consumer, like the fan experience, like all of those industries will be dramatically transformed once they do get back to normal. Um, you, you know, I think anything, anything that makes life feel normal again is a good thing for, um, for the like private investing world or public investing world. So, you know, things like the NCAA tournament happening again, like I don't have a specific opinion on that, except that I'll enjoy watching the games. Um, but, but it is, I think it's a good sign just in terms of like the light is at the end of the tunnel and people are starting to look past COVID, which for any category of investment is a good sign. Yeah, I would agree, I would agree with Hunter as well. We've made some, some plays in both entertainment and hospitality that we expect to do quite well as we come out of this, this pandemic. Yeah, I'm gonna say the same thing. Um, there's a couple of venture firms actually in Texas that are very focused on the sports ecosystems around the stadiums and around um, the fans and whatnot. We've got one company in our portfolio called Earbuds Music. It has Patrick Mahomes and Baker Mayfield, um, who are both investors and are also broadcasting and drop their playlists on game day. And Hunter, this one's for you. Um, I, um, <laughs> I lived in Chicago from 2003 to 2011, and I watched you play every weekend. And um, John Scully, <laughs> who's uh, Jeff Joniak's brother-in-law, is a good friend of mine. So really enjoyed oh, your oh, career. Wow. So, I think from my perspective, with, as it relates to sports, it, one of the things that I've been seeing too is uh, the proliferation of sports betting uh, as legalization continues uh, to happen. And in my opinion, across uh, Canada being, I think, a, an interesting geography that's going to happen soon uh, across multiple states, uh, I think we're going to see a continued rise of new technologies attacking that ecosystem, uh, especially as you think about. Um, you know, potentially, you know, repercussions with regards to blockchain uh, and that ecosystem as well. Um, yeah. So that's just, just something I've, I've been monitoring. I, I'm going to throw one other thing in there that is, I think is the huge alpha play of the next decade, and that is esports and the monetization mm -hmm. of that. There's a tremendous amount of work that's going on in that space right now, and, it, and, and that gaming marketplace is bigger than any other sports marketplace on the planet. And there's an internationalization theme out of it as well. So you have markets crossing geographies. We're not just single economies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think an interesting question is to ask your kids who Mickey Mantle is or Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> so keep on going. We got about uh, three or four more minutes. Um, my survey went away. Um, oh. So. Uh, um, so I think it was so, where, where are the gaps in uh, VC funding and where are the opportunities, right? So, right? so we I have think the gaps, that Michael answered that right, very well. Right, so we have gaps in, uh, so for me, access to additional capital outside of specific investments for funds, how critical is that? How do you view that as a fund? Um, and how do you leverage it? For example, there are, Michael, you started with a conversation about open access to the information and, and, and engagement with your LPs. And I'm curious how other folks do that in terms of supplemental capital, sidecar investment, leveraging that private information for direct investment, not just inside the fund. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about cost structures as well, um, you know, how those evolved. 
Sure, I mean, I can start there. Um, our fund um, has an optional investment component with it at a reduced management fee that allows people to invest inside the fund. It's very attractive to a lot of large scale family private offices who have a lot of capital to deploy. And so for instance, although we go through series B, we'll do pro ratas farther down the stack, but we also allow our investors, if they want to, to come in and invest and actually lead B rounds um, on some of our large companies that we're doing in the applied materials space, for instance, they're gonna need to build large scale factories to build these materials out. Um, it provides a very interesting set of investments for um, you know, the family offices who actually get to see our late stage deal flow before we actually make investments. Okay, so that, that strategy is find additional capital out of your LPs. Chris, is that something similar you're doing? Yeah, it's always important to make sure you know where their next round of funding is coming, whether it's going to be coming from, you know, additional funds from your own or, you know, group or others. We, we try to bring people in early. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this is a team sport. Uh, I, would, I would describe it that way. Uh, no, nobody wants to go it alone. No entrepreneur, no venture capitalist. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely important. And addressing the question of where's the gap, I think it's where, you know, myself and, and Michael and others are addressing. Getting money early has become extremely difficult, particularly for doing material sciences or something that's a physical product. It's, it's become a real challenge and a lot of opportunities get passed over for, you know, software me too plays that quite frankly are never going to return with some of these others will. So the diamonds in the rough are what we're looking for. So, all right. So your alpha is in... Your alpha is in difficulty to fund. You know, you're finding that. Okay, yeah. I was just going to point out. I think there's a bit of a gap in, uh, you know, in impact as well. You've got a, a few whales like uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures and, and and folks like that who are, you know, doing these massive uh, uh, decarbonization plays. And then you've got smaller funds or parts of funds that are dedicated towards impact. But as I mentioned earlier, there, there's a ton of unrealized alpha in in impact as well. And it would be cool to see a lot more funds that are just like focused on that and unapologetically say, we're going to do good things while making lots of money. I think the issue of impact has been that impact's been around for a long time. And a lot of people have lost a lot of money in it. So when you go back to the well too many times, they're like saying, maybe not. But it's, very, it's still very interesting. I mean, ESG has changed its name five times in the last 20 years. Yeah. Right? It used to be called, it's been called lots of different stuff. Um, but I, I find it really interesting. Uh, so I, I think we had a couple of extra questions remaining just on, on, on the topics for the VCs in terms of like, uh, you know, so, so Austin, um, robotics, there's a question about robotics and about uh, whether or not you invest in it or not. And what, and what are your thoughts on that? Or AI, you can, you know, there's the, the classic pieces, things related to um, AI and derivatives. So, so robotics is one of them, human understanding, big data, any, any pieces in that area? Um, well, I'll jump in. We look at a lot of robotics companies. We oh, look at space yes. tech and we do a lot of work with AI. Um, for instance, one of our companies is called Patcher. They actually are facilitating PCB design online. Um, for people who don't know what PCBs are, I know Chris has spent a lot of his life around PCBs, but printed circuit boards drive the world and they're inside of all of the IoT devices that are out there. We have a whole generation of students going back to the education theme that was talked about earlier that don't know how to actually make or build technology. And Patcher's actually working with teams of sixth graders to help them build IoT devices. So there's, you know, that is another one of these kind of things that's transitioning from the guys in the white lab coats that used to run the IBM 360 computers over to the de democratization of these processes and then speeding up um, delivery for hardware and, and the associated devices that go out with it. So there's just a ton of stuff to invest in out there. So that's a flavor of robots getting smaller into IoT devices. Anybody else looking at robotics? I know Austin has a couple of super interesting robotics companies. Any of you take a piece of them? Next play is an investor in UiPath, which is robotics process automation. They've they've just been priced in private markets at 35 billion. I think they're trading more than that in the secondary markets. So that's a company that will probably get public this year. Um, more of kind of a bet on the industry than a specific robotics company. Um, we tend to do that a lot. Like we don't have any direct. Um, we don't have any direct Bitcoin or cryptocurrency exposure, but we are investors in Coinbase. Like we, we, whenever there's a lot of hype around an industry, but it's still hard to pick the winners, 
sometimes the infrastructure that serves that industry is one of the best bets for investment on the direct side. Can, can I just jump in here again? I, I thought I'd cut off this question and ask you about co-investment for your funds. So, um, so we've been done a lot of Silicon Valley, average co-investment for Silicon Valley micro VC or Series A is about five to seven X these days. So, so what's your typical co-investment? Please just give a number. And also, um, do you guys preserve rights for next for the next you know round of financing on your deal? So, you know, what's the amount of co-investment? Give a number. And do you preserve rights? Yes or no? So, from my perspective, I'll start off there. Uh, I'm not uh, raising an, an institutional committed fund, so all of the deals I'm bringing uh, through my network are all actually co-investment opportunities. Uh, for each transaction, uh, and I do preserve rights uh, for follow-on investments uh, and have the goal of basically raising an opportunity fund kind of over time as that portfolio builds uh, from a timing perspective where you kind of have uh, an additional pool of capital that will be able to lead the growth rounds of those businesses uh, over time, uh, which I think is interesting. And since instead of it being a blind pool of capital, you have a committed fund of capital uh, chosen with the exact assets uh, that you would know you would be investing behind where you're able to actually see the progress of those businesses in advance of actually committing to that opportunity fund. And mm -hmm. next. So I'll jump in here. So any round that we do that's over $2 million in funding for a company, we preserve 50% of it for our investors to customize their own portfolios. Um, they do it on a dollar by dollar basis. Um, so if you've got $10 million in our fund, you have $10 million in optionality that you can use up. That optionality is given out on a pro rata basis. It does, uh, just does not go to the largest investors, although they get the biggest pieces. And if a particular transaction is not attractive to the larger investors, the smaller investors can actually have gobble up rights on more than their pro rata share. Perfect. Next. Sure. Uh, on the next place side, our direct investments are on a deal by deal basis. So Co-investment opportunities are based on the deal and whether there's capacity. I, I would also just add for that for the, the families, unsolicited advice, you've always got to ask yourself why you're seeing a deal. I and mean, if you're getting a, a series C or D deal out of Silicon Valley and you're in Texas, a whole lot of people have said no to that deal by the time you see it. So just keep that in mind on the direct investing side of why am I so lucky to have this look at this opportunity? luck indeed chris yeah i would say the same we we do uh you know take co-investment uh, follow-on rights uh you know helps build that that team around you the investors are part of the team too and as i said earlier this is this is a team sport this is not something you go alone do you have a number you target uh it, it varies considerably quite frankly depending on which area we're in and, and the types of deals so we, longer conversation i think we have left time at okay. this point yeah Fantastic. Well, listen, guys, great job. Um, I, I probably had like a 10 other questions on DeFi, et cetera, et cetera. There's actually some questions in the chat. So if you guys can log on to the chat or to the Q&A and answer those questions, that'd be really helpful. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. Um, you know, I, I know our audience is getting thirsty, so we've got about an hour and a half left of work to do here because we've got to, because since you're not here, we are and we're going to go drink. Um, um, folks are welcome to reach out to me directly. So I'm going to put my email we're in, in Texas, not yeah. in California. Yeah. Anyway, um, 